Welcome, everybody, to the California Historical Society. Uh, my name is Adam Hirschfelder. I uh, direct what we call strategic projects here at CHS. And over the past year, uh, that has included our efforts to celebrate the centennial of the Panama Pacific International Exposition. Uh, Was that for me or the World's Fair? <laughs> uh, as you may know, uh, over 60 different organizations, including ourselves, have been working to celebrate uh, PPIE, as we call it, by its initials, uh, in many different ways. And this is a very exciting uh, time of year, an exciting time for us at CHS. We've explored so many different uh, aspects of the fair here at CHS, and other organizations have as well. And uh, it's only going to get more exciting over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, with an opening of an exhibition at the De Young Museum, folks may know about, and then we have an exciting program here in November on food uh, at the fair, which was uh, an exciting thing then, and will be even more exciting 100 years later. But one of the you know, really miraculous things uh, about uh, the fair was all the preparations the city did to get ready for it. Uh, you think public transportation is challenging now? We were joking about... Uh, uh, things that the city is dealing with now regarding Central Subway and all the rest, um, what it was like 100 years ago to get ready for some 19 million people who were here at the fair um, without any of the type of uh, you know, infrastructure we have now. And I think that's going to be in part part of tonight's discussion and really shows what the city went through to get uh, ready for the fair. Uh, a couple things just about tonight. I think uh, when everybody sat down, you have evaluations. We ask that you please fill them out after uh, the program and drop them off uh, at the front desk uh, when you leave. Uh, at, uh, there's going to be a discussion, panel discussion, and then after it, uh, it'll be time for uh, Q&A, uh, is my understanding. Uh, before moving on, of course, thanking our uh, sponsor, uh, the Henry Mayo Newall Foundation, who has underwritten all of the California Historical Society's programs as they have related to the centennial of PPIE. And uh, so I'm going to introduce tonight's moderator. To my left, uh, Greg King here, who works for Parsons Corp now, uh, which is an engineering firm, but who has deep experience working on public transportation issues generally, but really here in San Francisco, including extensive uh, experience on the Van Ness BRT effort, which uh, we look forward to hearing more about. And as I said prior uh, to that, he worked at Caltrans early in his career. He will introduce the other panelists. Uh, we really appreciate everyone being here. We hope you'll come back for other programs we do, including the food program and stay involved with PPIE 100, which will last uh, throughout the uh, year. Uh, throughout the year, actually into early January. You can find out information both on the CHS website and ppie100.org. So thank you very much, and I will turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Teddy, did you want to say something now, or? I'm not sure. Okay. So this, this one's working too. I, let's just get settled here a little bit. Got my panelists. I want to wish everybody a good evening and thank you for coming out this evening. Yeah, thank, thank, yeah. thank you, Patty. I want to thank Patty for, for her efforts to put this panel together. She uh, contacted us up to almost a year ago and uh, she had asked us to get together in October and Michael was busy that night and I said, Michael, it's 2015, not 2014. She's trying to get us together. So we found a time. Um, tonight's uh, presentation title is Transformations in San Francisco Public Transit, Then, Now, and Tomorrow. And um, I think that we have a really great panel because we have people that are steeped in not only the past, and we have a transit historian, but we have two planners with us tonight that have a deep interest in history. So I think we can bridge a lot of the, uh, the items tonight with all three members. I want to give you just a little bit about myself because I know more about me than anybody else. Um, 
I went to school at UC Santa Barbara and uh, took a degree in public history. And uh, I was there back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, but the program's purpose at the time was to train academic historians to be in the public setting of archives and museums and corporations and so on to try to link the present uh, issues with the past and try to understand decision making in that framework. And so this particular panel is really good in my mind because of that interest in understanding where we are today and going tomorrow, but also the links to 100 years ago in the Pan Pacific International Exposition, or PPIE, of course. So the three speakers tonight are linked in their interest in transportation and transit, particularly here in the city, and um, we'll be able to speak to those tonight. Let me go ahead and introduce our speakers. No one is better qualified to speak to us on the subject of the theme of transit as it involves the PPI is, is Grant Ute. He's an associate of the Archives Department of the Western Railway Museum at Rio Vista Junction, and he specializes in its San Francisco and Alameda photographic image collections. The primary author of San Francisco's Municipal Railway, Muni, published by Arcadia Publishing in 2011, he has also collaborated with Market Street Railway in the development of the San Francisco Railway Museum and several of the shows on their transit history. Its current exhibit, PPI exhibit, Fair Please, Streetcars to the San Francisco 1915 Pan Pacific Exposition, can be seen at the 77 Stewart Street site. I don't know if, how many of you have been there. Um, yeah, it's excellent. It's really close to the Ferry Building. If you're at the Ferry Building, make the opportunity to walk across the street and see it. It's really wonderful. As a founder of the San Francisco Street Railway Archive, Grant has worked on the conservation of the Muni Railway's photo archive, many of which are online, and again, I invite you to take a look at that. Grant has also assisted the San Francisco Public Library's History Center by organizing the John G. Graham Collection of Street Railway Images. The book and the show draw freely from the many never published before treasures of the Muni and Western Railway Museum archives. In addition to the book I just mentioned, he also has written two other books in uh, collaboration with other historians. Uh, they include San Francisco's Market Street Railway, published by Arcadia in 2004, and Alameda by Rail, also published by Arcadia. Uh, the book, San Francisco Muni, is in our bookstore, and Grant would be happy to sign a copy for you if you'd like to purchase it after the evening's event. We also have, we're fortunate tonight to have to my immediate right, Peter Albert. Peter is the acting planning director of the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, which from now on I'll call Muni. Um, in his previous uh, work, uh, prior to becoming the assistant planning director, and he's been at Muni since 2006, he worked with uh, major project transportation planning in their Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Prior to Muni, he worked with BART. He worked with the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, where Michael works now. And also, he worked prior to that, San Francisco County, City and County Planning Department. So we have someone with us who has a really deep uh, root with planning here in, in uh, San Francisco. Peter earned a BA from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and a master's in urban and regional planning from San Jose State University. I'm also pleased that we have on our panel tonight to provide insights, Michael Schwartz. Michael specializes in multimodal planning, policy and analysis. He's a senior transportation planning with, planner with the San Francisco County Transportation Authority. And his master's at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, was in city planning and public health. I know Michael has a lot of interest in health as well as transportation. Health uh, is a public policy issue. And it, it, I, whereas I worked with Michael, I first met Michael approximately four or five years ago on the Van bu bus rapid transit. He'll speak to a little later tonight. Uh, had an opportunity to work with Michael and find him to be an engaging planner and thoughtful person. Uh, he thought, his, his, in addition to the BRT, Michael has worked on the redesign of Market Street, neighborhood plans in Potrero Hill and Bayview, and a parking study looking at how policies and parking affect congestion. He is leading the city's long-range transportation plan, looking at the next key transportation investments in San Francisco. So with that, I just have a question of you. <clears throat> how many of you took transit here tonight, either Muni or BART? Excellent. They're very good. And um, with that, I think you have maybe even a more interest in tonight's topic. And I also want to ask you um, this one. 
Could you t give me a hand if you are a resident of San Francisco or, or, or a previous resident of San Francisco? Here we go. Okay, good. Just so we have a, a sense of who we're speaking to tonight. So I'm going to turn over the dais to Grant, and he's going to walk us through a presentation that gives us the framework for tonight's discussion. Thank you, Grant. Great. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, uh, my job here is to kind of give the history and lay the, lay the background of, of all of this, and then we're going to break into a uh, panel discussion later. So uh, this is going to be kind of a fast-moving um, uh, discussion of many years of, of history. But I wanted to start out because we are talking about the centennial of the Panama Pacific Exposition, and there's many ways that this has been looked at by the PPIE 100, all the events going on. And you look back on it from the point of view architecture, there's graphic arts that were fantastic, there was... Um, the technology that was uh, portrayed, there was building this illusion uh, city uh, that kind of was there and then vanished. Um, and I think there's many ways to look at it, but I, what I think what we're trying to do here tonight is to really look at what were the lasting effects of it, because while they may have created an illusion on one hand and brought a lot of artistic uh, talent together, uh, it required a lot of real practical planning in order to make the PPIE at the success it was. So I'm going to do a little bit about that and then talk about the legacy infrastructure that we have. Um, obviously there was illumination, there was a whole color palette that they uh, developed. Uh, some of the first use of architectural exterior building lighting was introduced at the PPIE. But this also was a humanistic uh, event in that uh, people really saw themselves uh, uh, kind of on the forefront. In fact, literally cleaving a continent to make a passage from the old world to, uh, through the new world to Asia. So that was part of what the celebration was, was really about. But it was sort of a, um, a very uh, large scale um, conception of what people were doing. But in order to understand, I think, in the San Francisco context, we have to go back to the fire and earthquake, which really sets the stage for this whole um, development. Um, 500 square blocks of San Francisco were destroyed. Um, there was a firestorm that raged for uh, three days after the earthquake in 1906. Um, and a quarter of a million po of the population of the city exited the town. Uh, this is from the Muni photo archive, and a lot of these images come from that, which is kind of San Francisco's uh, family album. Uh, this is the postcard row up at um, um, Alamo Square. But the key thing about the understanding of, the, of San Francisco's reconstruction, I think, has to do with the resilience of the city and the resilience of the population. When we were preparing the centennial of the, of the earthquake, and I did a show at Mark Street Railway with that, um, that was around the time Katrina hit. And we went through this whole look at what happens in a city and how it sometimes the struggle to get back on its feet. Well, this picture here, I think, really um, taken at Fremont and Market, I think really reflects, even though the man is posed, that kind of optimistic uh, attitude about rebuilding. And even though the, the northeast quadrant of San Francisco looked like a moonscape, um, the, there was no doubt that San Francisco would re be rebuilt because it was, after all, the um, tenth largest city in the United States. It sat on the west coast, and it was the port to the newly found, um, uh, newly uh, developed um, territories in, in the Pacific. So by 1907, this uh, photo kind of shows that some of the <coughs> reconstruction had really progressed, although the city was under reconstruction probably for the next 10 to 15 years, but substantial progress had been made within the first year. By the time the, um, the fair was awarded to San Francisco in 1911 and President Taft came out to Golden Gate Park in October of 11 to um, do the ceremonial groundbreaking, what's remarkable is that they didn't have the site selected at this point. Um, so they opened, they did the groundbreaking in Golden Gate Park where none of the events would occur. Um, this is a great uh, uh, chronicle um, uh, or San Francisco call um, uh, cartoon that talks about the various sites that were being considered, including uh, the uh, Bayview area, Lake Merced, Golden Gate Park, uh, Lincoln Park, uh, Harbor View, the Marina District, which was ultimately chosen. And the idea here was there's so many competitors with ideas of where to have this here, why don't we just put it on a truck and move it around town according to a schedule. But obviously the Harbor uh, View uh, uh, setting had many um, advantages, uh, not only just weather and that, it all afforded a portion of it to be used from the uh, Presidio grounds, but it also, since this was both a national uh, uh, 
a local but also a regional event, it allowed for there to be a ferry boat service into the, um, the fairgrounds. And additionally, it was within walking distance for over 50,000 San Franciscans. But when they did an assessment, the Harborview site had certain um, uh, drawbacks, not the least of which was the fact that it sits uh, in a bowl and it's divided from the um, North Beach by, by the um, uh, hills and also by, from Pacific Heights from the new population centers along Fillmore Street and out in the Mission District. So the problem about Harborview was how do we get people to the site? There's no level land routes through there. And uh, just to point out, this is a, from a planning document by Brian Arnold, who was a um, uh, transit planner who did a report to the supervisors in 1913. There's several uh, key infrastructure proposals here, one of which is the Stockton Tunnel, which um, is down, yeah, here it is, yeah. And then the, a Broadway Tunnel. Um, Additionally, there's a Fillmore Street tunnel, which would have gone from Sutter Street over to Filbert. And then a tunnel underneath Fort Mason, which was built to bring supplies in. It wasn't for, for transportation. But that was the way they proposed doing it. Um, and of course, we know the Stockton Street tunnel was built, and we'll go through that. Uh, the Broadway tunnel was built in 1952. Uh, the um, Fort Mason Tunnel was, was constructed, uh, but only for bringing in uh, uh, supplies and exhibits by rail. So when they looked at the tunnel construction, this is a, another interesting uh, example of how public opinion is molded, where we see here the, um, the uh, Stockton Street merchants jumping up and down with money bags saying, bore on through, old man, I'm with you. And this is the, the whole concept, we're going to bore through the Stockton Street Tunnel. Well, those merchants, uh, when they were successful, this is what they got. This is Stockton Street looking north from uh, Sutter at what is the bore of the Stockton Street Tunnel here. And furthermore, they got into some problems when this building was undermined and they had to uh, spend additional money shoring that up. But just if you have problems with Stockton Street, uh, with the Central <laughs> Subway, okay, this is what your great grandparents had to deal with. <laughs> Uh, this is the Stockton Tunnel shortly after its opening in 1914. Uh, it shows um, the portal and sort of the area around it. And again, there's still reconstruction um, needs to be done. Well, if you go to the Fillmore Street Tunnel, uh, if you think of it, it was going to, this is the north side of, um, uh, a film, uh, 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 of Sutter Street near Fillmore, so they would have had to take out some buildings and, and put the portal in, but it would have run about uh, 4,000 feet at a grade probably similar to that of Twin Peaks Tunnel, but it would have gone out and entered uh, the Cow Hollow area about Filbert Street. So you would have had this, this tunnel that was going to cost $3 million in 1911 and we would translate that to about 70 million today. This is the main entrance of the fair, um, and one of the things it shows, this is at um, um, uh, Chestnut and Scott, one of the things it shows, in addition to the, um, the ice plant wall here, is a shell station. This was one of the three parking lots on um, Chestnut Street that was established for automobiles to go to the fair. There was one other larger one on Van Ness Avenue, essentially where the Galileo High School field is now. That was the larger thing. But they only had four um, um, automobile lots planned. And that's despite the fact that there was a working Ford autom automobile uh, assembly plant at the fair. But really, automobile traffic to the fair was not going to be, was not in consideration. Um, despite these uh, merrymakers on this double-deck bus, probably brought up from Los Angeles, um, uh, bus transportation to the fair really wasn't practical either. These are kind of unreliable vehicles, and even though this looks like a big crowd on here, uh, it really was not a substantial contributor to traffic to the fair. This bus lasted two days in service before it was T-boned by a Turk Street streetcar, and you can see where the trolley catcher went through and the outline of the streetcar. And then, um, then the wheels were out. So uh, essentially, uh, bus transportation was not a substantial um, option. One of the things that was emerging at that time, however, was jitneys. They were a national threat to public transportation because people could get cheap cars 
uh, outfit them. They didn't have to pay any licensing or any uh, franchise fees. And so the streets started in Oakland, San Francisco, and other major cities started to swarm with these unregulated um, uh, automobiles that went into direct competition with the streetcar companies. And it was a huge problem. But it was also a safety problem. If you read papers from that period about the number of deaths and injuries that were being caused, and here again, uh, our um, uh, fearless witnesses at the Call editorial cartoon page are showing us the difficulty of getting across the street with these um, things. This is a photo from the city engineer's file. They went down and documented this. Um, uh, this is a jitney. You can see, I think it says 22nd in Valencia here, five cents. And there are many other pictures with swarms of these jitneys on Market Street. Um, jitneys provided some service to the fair, but again, were not really the, um, um, a substantial asset. So, I wonder where the next picture went. Okay. Um, there were a number of routes. We talked about the Fillmore Tunnel, and the reason for the Fillmore Tunnel was when they looked at the routes going to the fair, um, there was really the streetcar service on Fillmore Street, streetcar service on Polk Street, the Hyde Street cable car line, all of which were totally inadequate to the needs of getting hundreds of thousands of people to this site. Um, this is the problem with the Fillmore line, which ran standard side streetcars up to Broadway and Fillmore, where they stopped. And you can see in the background the uh, fair in the background here. And what was in place, though, was this unique counterbalance cable car electric streetcar system that ran the 25% grade from Broadway down to Green Street. But they were small little cars, and this is, shows how they were hooked to a cable, and one car going down would pull the other car coming back up. Um, the United Railroads, which was one of the, the, the private uh, streetcar company in the city, just tried to maximize this route. They took the cars, they closed them, and they linked them together, and um, uh, using a multiple unit operation, tried to get people to ride down this hill. Now, I think this was probably one of the greatest rides at the fair. <laughs> um, and this is the hill, and you all probably know this hill today, but. In this picture, you can see six of these two-car trains transiting Fillmore Street from the top where the, um, the major streetcar routes ended and then trying to ferry everybody down to the fair. This is a picture taken by uh, Jesse Brown Cook showing uh, down at um, uh, Green Street. Uh, these are two jam-packed um, uh, dinkies coming down the Fillmore Hill, but what's most important about this picture is everybody else has given up and there's like this parade going down the sidewalk. <laughs> So the key concept, I think, for the organizers of the, the fair was they recognized that if you had a fair and you didn't have crowds, uh, it would be a failure. Um, the other side of it was if you had congestion and you didn't have effective mass transportation, it wouldn't be a failure. It would be a disaster because no one would be able to go. So the planner's problem was how do you build capacity to take people to this fair and make it work without overbuilding capacity that you're never going to use for the uh, time that it takes to pay it all off. So that was the, the planning challenge that um, those planners faced, and I think my partners up here on the uh, podium are facing today. So the solution was uh, adequate streetcar service. And again, the, the call, who's a, a cheerleader for progressive um, public um, um, activities, uh, here puts it out that this is going to be, we're going to skate to the fair on public transit. Well, the issue really fell to the, to the fledgling municipal railway, which was um, really only started operations 26 months before the fair opened. And it was a 1909 bond issue where the bond issues to buy the, the Geary Street line were, were, were passed. Um, also, two weeks later, you note in this slide here, they're, they're congratulating uh, the passage of the Geary Street bonds, but also the Hetch Hetchy water supply bonds are going to be two weeks later. So the linking of municipal ownership of public transit, which was profit making, and the water supply and hence clean electric power were tied together back here in 1909. This is the opening of the Muni at, at um, uh, Geary and Kearney streets, and you see that this was a huge civic event. And when you look at the opening of the Twin Peaks Tunnel, the J Line, I mean thousands of people come to these events because they really are participating in this unique concept of a municipally owned transportation system, which was rather no novel in a, in a large city at, at, that, at that time. 
So this picture, while it says 15, is really in 14, but it really shows that the Panama Pacific is open and San Francisco is inviting the world. Um, the strategy had been to engage the private uh, uh, transfer provider, the United Railroads, in providing service to the fair, but there was a whole struggle going on related to the graft corruption uh, charges um, and trials that went on, and the United Railroads was in very, very um, low public esteem at the time. And the pushback from the city was they were really tying them in on franchises. So early on in the planning for the fair, the United Railroads said, we're not going to build one foot a track to this thing because we can never get franchises out of you to, to make it pay off. So it really became clear that the Muni was going to have to do the heavy lifting in terms of getting the people over there. Um, so to give you an idea, this is a, a shot probably in the, um, well, two weeks into the fair uh, at uh, the ferry uh, plaza. And um, here you see the kind of traffic that generates there. Remember, this was the second busiest passenger terminal in the world at this time behind Char Charing Cross Station in, in London. So this is a major point of entry to San Francisco from the East Bay. Uh, this is an image taken by the city engineer and you can see various forms of getting to the fair. You got a, a taxi rack here. Here's a, a truck or is it a bus or is it a sled? I'm not sure what it is, but it says you, you can go to the fair on this thing. Um, also evident here is a, is a United Railroad's number 34 car, which was a route they cobbled together. Now they promised they wouldn't build a foot of track. They did probably build about 10 yards of track, putting some switches in, so they could link the ferry building to their Polk Street line along Su um, uh, Sutter Street. So they ran, a, they developed about four lines that just basically looped over their existing trackages. The other uh, point up here is the Columbus Street line, which was the end of the Union Street line that the Muni purchased in 1913. They ran a Columbus Avenue line, the original J line, uh, from the North Ferry Terminal, and that was a Muni operation. Here you can see this uh, Richard, uh, um, or J.B. Monaco picture on Columbus Avenue of, of the original J cars going to the uh, Panama Pacific Exposition. Market Street Railway wasn't foolish though. They, they recognized that their stub end terminal at the end of Polk Street was not gonna be able to turn around the, the number of cars that they needed to do. They were hoping to get um, uh, 12,000 passengers an hour over this line. So in order to do that, they decided they would rent this property in this um, lot and put a loop in. Uh, the property over here is really the site right now where Balboa, I, I mean, um, um, Galileo High School is. And this shows the loop in operation with a car that they had linked over Polk Street to go out to the mission. And here's the fair in, in full operation in the background. So Muni had to complexify its operation. This is um, uh, the Geary Street line where it crossed the Van S. And here's what Muni had to put in in order to have a three-way um, turning radius from Geary on to Van S and from, um, from Van S on to Geary to, for the new lines that it, that it established. It also um, linked uh, its lines with, a, with, a, with the Petrero district with the Van Ness Avenue and the H car that went out Petrero. And this is laying of the tracks on Van Ness Avenue um, in 1914 for that line. That served as a very important crosstown line and a corridor we're going to be talking about later. Uh, but this is really laying down the transit corridor for PPIE uh, and this linked the Geary Street lines with the uh, Union Street operations and, and the, the whole fair. And in the background, you see the tower of the new city hall uh, going up. The, another image of the city hall under construction, putting the facade on it. So by opening day on February 20th, all the city uh, marched out to the, uh, to the fair on Van Ness Avenue. Um, this is uh, showing some of the uh, municipal railway lines. This was a, a line called the I line, the letter I. And what Muni did is they ran service from 33rd and Geary down Geary Street, then down Van Ness, and then over Union around the loop at the, um, Scott and Chestnut. Now, this is one of the only pictures we have of, of these cars. They ran this only on weekends and on large uh, capacity days. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the uh, cars from Columbus Avenue unloading on San Francisco Day, which was one of the, they, they figured this would be about 20 days where there'd be over 100,000 people at, at at the expo, and this was one of the days they, they 
knew would be a big day. <coughs> so by the, <clears throat> the closing day of, of um, the fair, um, Muni had really stepped up to the plate. And they had, just when they opened, they had put uh, 90 new car crews of, 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 of motormen and conductors on the street in the prior two weeks. And they operated the first day of the fair and they had no accidents. And it really was quite a thing to competently not only build, construct, plan, but to also uh, execute the operations of this. And they were very flexible because the population on various days went up and down, so they had to be making a lot of um, uh, decisions about uh, staffing and routing all throughout the fair. So this is um, just an image of the closing night festivities of the Panama P uh, Pacific Exposition. Muni's closing day revenues were $16,700. And at a five cent fare, what you realize, that was a third of a million fares went through the Muni fare box on that one day. Um, it's important because I think that shows how many people rode Muni, and others were still riding United Railroads over there, but public transit was the transit to the fare. Um, now, that money was also profit. Uh, the city didn't get into the street railway business only as we see it now as a public service. Uh, street railways were made millions of dollars a nickel at a time. So the incentive was like public ownership of gas and electric utilities. So were um, streetcar systems at that time. And that money uh, was used for quite some time afterwards. So just, you know, we can look back now with the, um, we're paying homage to the lighting by the lighting up of the ferry <coughs> building now. But, you know, we can look at some of the structures from the fair that exist. The Palace of Fine Arts, of course, that's our, our major um, monument to the, the vision of the fair, and that exists. Uh, here it is being repurposed in the 1960s to store um, uh, surplus Muni trolley buses. Uh, the Exploratorium went in there. Uh, the Exhibition Auditorium, that was a gift of the fair to the city, and we're still using that. Uh, the new city hall, while it uh, was just, uh, it was made, it constructed during the time of the fair, and it is a monument to that era. It didn't have any uh, uh, PPIE uh, funding in it. But the main public library, one of the things I, I came across was that when it opened in 1917, now the Asian Art Museum, I came across this thing that stunned me. That was the largest bondholder in that building, uh, the construction of that building, was the San Francisco Municipal Railway. They had so much surplus money that they were able to buy bonds in the public library. I, I gave this presentation to Muni staff a year or so ago, and I, uh, Ed Riskin, the director, was sitting behind me, and I, I turned to him and I said, wouldn't you like to live in that world where you had that kind of money? Um, but of the infrastructure and remnants that we still have today, the Stockton Street Tunnel is one of them. Uh, we saw it under construction. This is the Stockton Street Tunnel in 19. 50, right before streetcar service was abandoned. Um, they were, they put new lighting in and the city went out and took this picture. But it's also important to realize that 35 years later, this track is worn out. Uh, the, you'd have to reinvest in the streetcar um, uh, system then, which the city decided not to do. The Fort Mason Tunnel is still a remnant of that. It, it sits there, it's not used at this point. Um, and, uh, but it still is one of the infrastructure legacies we have. The Broadway Tunnel, while not built for the fair, uh, was conceived of during the fair, and um, it was constructed in 1952 at a $6 million cost. But there are other infrastructure um, legacies of the Panama Pacific Exposition, primarily through the profit that Muni made. When they were simultaneously constructing the Twin Peaks Tunnel, that was all paid for by a, a assessment, uh, a beneficial use assessment on people that lived in the 5,000 acres in the western part of, the, of, of, uh, of San Francisco. Um, and some people that lived on the, in the Castro to, to um, Church Street area of Market Street. Um, but that only paid for the actual bore of the tunnel. The track and the wire was paid for out of those surplus earnings of the Muni Railway uh, during the PPIE and also during the United Railroad strike of 1917. They had money left over. They bought 21 new streetcars for the Union Street line. Those served the city uh, all the way till 1948. So what was the legacy of the fair uh, from the point of view of infrastructure? Well, we had the st a streetcar route structure that lasted the citizens of the city for 35 years. 
uh, a fleet of 125 cars that lasted another 44 years. Uh, they got tremendous operational experience that allowed them to handle the, the United Railroad strike in World War I, and arguably, since a lot of the same management was there, they were able to deal with a lot of the challenges of World War II from the experience they had from, uh, Muni had from operating the, uh, the PPIE. And, but above all else, I think it, it demonstrated that Muni was a vital and a mature agency of a city that knows how. So if we leave that legacy behind, well, so then what happened? I think that now we're going to segue into our panel discussion. And I have a number of images here just to give you an idea that the, the H line, which we saw under construction on, on Van Ness Avenue, um, did uh, soldier on until about 1950. Uh, this is a picture of City Hall with, um, if we're talking about bus rapid transit, well, this is bus slow transit with greyhounds coming out. Um, the H line was extended, though, from its terminal at uh, 25th and Petrero, um, an army in Petrero, underneath what is now the uh, uh, Army Street Circle, out Bayshore Boulevard in San Bruno Avenue. So it became a major um, uh, crosstown line. The um, uh, Muni had tried to get service on its Stockton Street line, which ended at Market in Stockton, down to the SP Depot. But the United Railroad says, that's okay, we'll haul all those people and take all their money. We won't let you go down there. But as soon as the Muni consolidated with the Market Street Railway, they extended the F line down to the Southern Pacific um, a station, which is essentially what we're talking about with the, the um, uh, Chinatown subway to, to some extent. There was a transition that went on uh, by mode. Here we see the transition from one of the original Muni streetcars to electric trolley buses. Of all the lines constructed for the fares and the original um, um, uh, Geary Street line, all but the Geary Street line became trolley bus operations. So this is the, um, the tunnel at the end of the, um, uh, basically the end of streetcar operation. So it's, that is one of the infrastructure elements that we have today uh, that we basically can look back to uh, Panama Pacific Exposition. So every time you go through there, think about the, that, what this was. It was needed for the PPIE, but it also was needed to take pressure off of Kearney Street, where it was the, which was the only um, access for trucks and wagons going to North Beach. So this offered a, not only a, a transit uh, access to the fair, but also a, an alternate route, a level route to um, um, uh, North Beach. So we'll kind of allow our other panelists to take the show on from here uh, and tell you about kind of what's, what's happened since and get a sense of how that's all fits together for us. Thank you. I, I think that's my cue. I'm Peter Albert. I work at the MTA. It's fascinating to hear your talk, Grant. What, what helped me uh, with the, this conversation was to take that step back and understand how volatile, how changing the city always is and how many huge projects we, we just sort of take for granted. We come into San Francisco, we think that the Golden Gate Bridge was here forever or we don't understand the conversations that led to stopping the freeways and building BART that are a huge part of the, the legacy we have now. I, I worked in the planning department, I see some of my colleagues here, and I had the chance to look at the general plan, which was a great opportunity to, to think about that history of San Francisco and put it in context. I, these images here are some of the early images about rapid transit around the Bay Area. As, as Grant said, ferries were the main way to get to and from San Francisco, and about the time they were talking about the bridges, they were also understanding a need for some regional rapid transit system. That concepts of that came up even before then. You might recognize some of the early visions of the BART. Um, let's see, this is the laser thing, I think. You want the, um, the laser? Yep. Yeah. It's, it's this up right here. Got it. There you go. So you see the BART system. Actually, at that time, they had the idea that BART might go up into Marin, crossing the Golden Gate, and going down to San Jose. And actually, there's bits of that conversation still happening as BART's doing its extension. The image of a train running down the middle of a new freeway is kind of mixing the rapid transit idea with the whole freeway movement. This is a map I'm sure a lot of people have seen before. This is what the vision was going to be for San Francisco in the mid-40s to the late 40s. They called it the traffic ways plan. They were looking jealously at Los Angeles and all of the great things that are happening down there. These freeways are being built left and right. And it's kind of stunning if you linger on this map, 
what was in store for San Francisco. The very exposition site would have been in the shadow of a whole bunch of freeways that were linking downtown to the Golden Gate Bridge to the peninsula. So I think those, those of you who spend any time in San Francisco know this is the kind of image that scared people witless and said, let's have a freeway revolt. And they sort of did because they saw these kinds of changes. Here's a great image of Market at Octavia with a streetcar going down it. Here's what happened when we started building freeways over these, these streets and started changing the very frame of view that we had, the view toward the ferry building from, from Upper Market, completely compromised by freeways that were all in the idea of expediency. Like this was the way we were gonna move effortlessly through San Francisco. There would be no traffic, no congestion because they're freeways. So this is what we saw. And you saw how glorious the ferry building was in the old images and it's stunning for people who've never been to San Francisco in that time to see how that walled off the very heart of the city from the rest of the city. Um, then along came 1989. And actually there were some initiatives before that. People might remember in 86 there was a try at the ballot to see if we could take down the Embarcadero Freeway and replace it with transit and all of that. And there was a good debate, but there wasn't the impetus that we have with the earthquake. The earthquake gave us that sobering wake up call about is this what we do? Do we do elevated freeways? Can we spend millions of, hundreds of millions of dollars retrofitting them or should they just come down and we think about transportation differently? About, you know, a little bit before this time, we had declared ourselves a transit first city. We had the rapid transit networks that were coming to link the city in BART, Muni Metro, the ferries were reactivated in the 70s to link back to Marin. But this was sort of the nail in the coffin of the freeway movement. We benefited splendidly from the idea that the freeways could come down. So this is the Embarcadero that we know today. The grant generously gave a nice image of the old and the new next to each other. So sometimes the newest thing is, some of the, is sometimes the oldest idea, including the old streetcars and the new streetcars that run on the Embarcadero. That's actually an interesting conversation. What we think of San Francisco moving around has become one of our iconic ways of moving around. The idea of the cable car as a national monument that moves, or the F-line streetcars as a big cell of coming to San Francisco and experiencing it in a way that no other city can offer. Maybe New Orleans and, and a few other lines have, have heritage streetcar lines, but it's more than just transportation. It's become part of our business. Now, um, we'll jump ahead a bit into what's, what's happening now. The freeways are down. Transit is the way we're supposed to go forward. We have a lot of catching up to do if you know transit pretty well. This is an image of the Van Ness bus rapid transit line, and it's juxtaposed nicely with the old H line. I think it was the, the streetcar line. Michael here on my right has worked extensively, as has Greg, on this idea of the, the bus rapid transit line running up and down Van Ness Avenue. Um, and Michael, anytime you want to jump in and take the microphone and wave it. But I was going to scroll through it. This was, when I came to the authority, this was an image that accompanied our idea of taxing ourselves with the sales tax. I don't know how many people remember the four quarter plan. It was the, the way we launched our half cent sales tax for transit outside the BART sales tax. And the idea was these were the corridors that needed the help. The Bayshore line, the Chinatown line, the Van Ness line, and the Geary line. And we talked about them as rail lines, we talked about them as bus lines, but they, we talked about them as corridors that were so congested, so critical to movement, they needed some serious attention. So, and actually, we're kind of going that way now. This image of what happened with the T-3rd and its plan to Central Subway pretty much complements the I'll toggle back and forth. You see the Bayshore line into Chinatown, you see the Central Subway line. That's actually a direct result of that sales tax plan back in 1989. And these BRT lines, you saw the image of the Van Ness line, and a nice image in the bottom left corner of showing what that looks like. That marks a transit trail from Market Street pretty much all the way to Fort Mason. And on the right-hand side are some images for Geary. So this four-corridor plan that was kind of already teased at with the exposition and voted on in 1989 is actually our work program for the next 20 years. Now, I just left this image because we talk so much about the historic issues of getting out to the northwestern part of the city. This is, the, on the right is the image of the Central Subway, which is an extension of the T-3rd line, and that extra bit of track that gets out toward North Beach and stops. It's not planned to be a station, it's just the way that they were ex excavating the drill. A lot of conversation is going on now about what happens next. Do we extend that line into Chinatown and North Beach? The top image may be a bit hard to see, 
But there are already studies that the MTA has had about not just stopping at Chinatown and North Beach or Fisherman's Wharf, but perhaps going into the Presidio. And then the image below that, the gray image with the orange line, is very much uh, a, a conversation about the federal plan, federal funded plan to extend the streetcar through that Fort Mason tunnel that Grant showed that was for freight and have that be a connection of the F line into the marina district. So sometimes the best old ideas are the ideas that are still hanging around. And I think I stopped my part of it now and happy to let my panelists join me. This is a. Uh, oh, you want to you want to talk about this? Go ahead. Later. Go ahead. This is up there. Well, just if you're interested in uh, learning a little bit more about this, a couple opportunities. One is the show at the um, uh, Mark Tree Railway Museum. Fair, please. Uh, it's up there now. If you go down there, it's 77 Stewart Street. That's one thing. I also have some copies of a journal article I did. If you have a real interest in this in more detail, I have some of these with me too, so you can see me about getting some of them later on. Okay, so I've got some questions, and I haven't re we haven't rehearsed, uh, we have some discussions, so it's going to be new. And so I'm going to throw the first question to both Michael. And I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to throw the first question I have uh, to Michael and Peter to jump in. Uh, strictly speaking, as planners, what was the most surprising thing you learned from Grant's presentation tonight? Um, there were a couple of things. I think the 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 Fillmore Street Tunnel was definitely something I had never heard of before uh, this presentation, and um, I think that we've talked a little bit about you know what that would look like to have this major artery um, underground, just the way we have with the Stockton Tunnel and the Broadway Tunnel, and what that would mean. Um, you know, I think part of me feels like it would be amazing to have that right of way and be able to dedicate it to, I think, um, part cars, part transit, and part bikes and pedestrians as it was originally envisioned. But I think knowing how the city went and the rest of Peter's talk, I think it would have ended up looking a lot like the Broadway Tunnel and really being a major traffic auto artery, really bringing even more cars through the heart of the city and onto the rest of the network. And I think that it's um, one of those things where the perspective of, of many years later to think about something may look like a certain opportunity when we have it at the time, and you, um, I think we are always happy to have grade-separated transportation, um, particularly underground, um, but sometimes the legacy and the people who come um, to make decisions later may have a completely different idea of what it is and um, not really understanding the consequences of these things for many years. Mine is actually kind of easy. Uh, I, I worked with some of the folks in the room on the challenge when I found out that we were gonna have the America's Cup and that was gonna be located at the Marina Green. They said, make the transit work. Get those people out there and try not to get them out there in cars. And I thought, holy cow, how do you get all those people? Because remember, there was that one weekend where we had Fleet Week and Hardly Strictly Bluegrass and the Castro Fair and, the, and Columbus Day Parade and America's Cup and a 49ers game and a Giants game all in the same weekend. And we thought we were just gonna collapse under the weight of it all. I thought I was pretty heroic until I saw how you got the people out there back in 1915. So I'm properly humbled by the task of San Francisco 100 years ago doing it and even more so. Thank you, Peter. So you mentioned the Giants. So one of my uh, favorite subjects is baseball. So um, tonight there's a game, but I'm here. This, um, in baseball, when a pitcher knocks down a hitter, such as Hunter Pence or Buster Posey, the better, the good ones, get up, dust himself off, and get a base hit in many cases. Was that the case with San Francisco after 1906 and after 1989? I'll just speak very quickly. Um, you know, I think that I'm a native of Chicago, where we had our own great fire and um, tragedy and the city sort of being reborn. And I think that... Um, it's hard for us to imagine, those of us living today, I, I suppose people here were, who, were, who were here in 1989 have some sense of this, but um, they're great tragedies, but then they actually become sort of amazing opportunities, once in a generation, once in multiple generation, opportunities to rethink. And I think Peter put it very eloquently uh, when thinking about our elevated freeway system uh, in 1989. And um, to me, what is, is very obvious is some of the greatest 
monuments of our city, some of the greatest infrastructure were born both of, of tragedy. And as someone who works near the Hayes Valley area, I'm a direct beneficiary of the teardown of, of the Central Freeway. And it's one of those things, and not to mention the Embarcadero Freeway. And it's sort of hard to even imagine what that looked like. And on the net, it seems like the city really seized the opportunity. It came out stronger and more resilient than it was even before those great tragedies. Well, just in terms of the um, um, reconstruction after the 1906 earthquake, um, the resilience is really important. You know, the city had a very young population, and I think uh, John Freeman, who many of you have probably heard at uh, other uh, talks, did a, a, a paper about um, the, comparing the reconstruction of San Francisco, which is his major interest, with the tragedy of Katrina in New Orleans. And I think the important lesson of that is that um, Reconstruction isn't necessarily uh, an opportunity. You know, it may or may not happen. It has a lot to do with um, the perceived uh, position of the city and um, its wealth, uh, whether people are going to invest, and whether local people are committed to the reconstruction. And I think one of the things that caused me to pause was when you realize that that reconstruction of San Francisco, um, which was, by the way, the largest urban disaster to ever befall a city in the United States, and it was for 99 years until Katrina by constant dollars. Um, the fact is that the city was largely rebuilt with local capital. There wasn't uh, federal aid coming in. There were blankets and things like that. But the federal government wasn't going to give any money to San Francisco because of the obvious corruption that was going on here. So you have to think about the kind of civic leadership and civic commitment that will bring about a reconstruction. And you know, if you think about now, when we have the next disaster here, Will there be that type of committed leadership that, that feels connected to San Francisco? And that's a, a real question. Thank you, Grant. Now, many of you are familiar with Southern California's history and the Pacific Electric red car system, which was pretty extensive uh, and taken away in the uh, early 50s. And now they're rebuilding the transit system in Los Angeles. How was San Francisco, how was it able to cling to much of its infrastructure over the years, whereas Southern California and LA in particular saw it scrapped? Why is San Francisco different? I, I've heard some good stories about that. I understand San Francisco is one of the few cities in America that has a remaining streetcar system. There's Philadelphia, there's Boston, there's San Francisco, there's New Orleans. It's a really, relatively small number. And what I heard, and maybe Grant, you have more of the authority on that, is some of the lines that are streetcar lines still are because there were segments of it that had special right-of-way. The Anjuda, for instance, has the Sunset Tunnel. The M Ocean View has that pathway that goes uh, through um, Lakeshore Acres. Uh, the J Church has, uh, apparently, a controversial right-of-way that goes through Dolores Park. So these, and the West Portal Tunnel, of course, was its own. So that was, what I heard is part of the reason we didn't lose all of our streetcars to, to buses and to uh, auto traffic. There, there were plans to eliminate the J line um, and put electric trolley buses on it. Um, but, and there was also a plan to, to uh, f uh, just have essentially a streetcar system that ran out to, to St. Francis Circle and then have a bus terminal out there. But um, in the end, um, uh, you know, the people did preserve the five, car, five line system that we enjoy today and is the basis for our system. Um, and I think that's pretty much the, um, the, the, the infrastructure, the tunnels, uh, and the idea of how would you ventilate them. And remember when you're thinking about doing that in 1948, buses didn't have quite the carrying capacity that streetcars still have. So that was a challenge as well. Uh, probably the most controversial one though is taking the streetcars off of Geary Street and um, how that, and converting that to buses and how that system, that line has just not worked since 1956, no matter what we try with it. Maybe BRT will be a, a solution, but that was uh, as an issue that um, uh, kind of still haunts us today. Thank you. I'm gonna open this one, probably maybe target more towards Michael, but certainly uh, Peter and Grant can join in. What special challenges and opportunities, which you said is often the same flip of a coin, sorry, different sides of the same coin. What special challenges and opportunities does a city such as San Francisco, which has a really rich history and heritage and legacy, as Grant used that term, play in current planning and your day-to-day -day working in this world where we have this rich tradition of 
historic infrastructure? Yeah, it's a really great question. I think that I feel very lucky to have entered the profession um, in a really special time in this city and really across the country in that um, I think people are finally, not finally, but people are really understanding what the challenges are. I think we have this absolutely roaring economy, um, even by San Francisco standards, and traffic is really at, at levels and transit crowding is at these levels that I think people have probably not experienced since some of these pictures that Grant was showing where um, it was one of the only ways to get around and before all this infrastructure was here. And I think that people are wondering how can we, people still want to keep coming here, jobs are coming here, housing's coming here, how are we going to grow and how are we going to get all these people around the city? And I think that um, for the first time we're, um, we're having real conversations about what are, what are the next subway lines? Many people may have seen that Supervisor Wiener recently called for a subway plan that we should always have at least one subway line under construction in San Francisco to really move the kinds of people and the kinds of numbers that I think the region wants us to have, that San Francisco wants to have here in the city. And these are the kinds of moves that you look here. Um, these are legacy projects that um, even in the timeline of, of our careers, we, won't, we may not even know the ramifications and the benefits, but 100 years later, you know, we're, we're all very grateful to have some of those, those rail lines. Um, I think you know, another great opportunity was when BART came to the city and Muni put its um, core subway system in Market Street. And I think we're nearing the point where we're gonna be making those kinds of decisions again. Um, and at the same time, many of you have seen there's sort of this proliferation of technology-enabled transportation, and nobody quite knows what to do with this. This is sort of the Lyfts, the Ubers of the world, some of these tech shuttles, um, private shuttles, car sharing, bike sharing. There's all this new stuff that is really in its nascency. It's less than really 10 years old, a lot of these technologies. And I think we don't quite even know what um, the influence that will be on our system, but I think that there is um, very clearly uh, we're on the verge of, of a real change in how people um, get around, and we've certainly turned a corner in how people see their city, that they really want to claim public space um, to be a, a pleasant place to walk around our city, to be able to bike around, um, and that is really a, uh, it's sort of an old sentiment that is new once again. So, very exciting. Uh, I actually want to play on the, the theme about walking. I think when you look at Los Angeles and San Francisco, which are two cities that we love endlessly to try to compare to each other. And I gotta say, I think LA is a really impressive city. I'm not a person to bash LA, except for when it comes to baseball, but I think that, <laughs> I, I think those are two very different cities for a bunch of reasons. Uh, San Francisco built out much earlier, was constrained by geography in a way Los Angeles wasn't. Los Angeles needed water to become the kind of city it became, but it also became a snowbird city where people were leaving a sort of urbanity it was built a generation or two after San Francisco that was basically built by, I hear people say, Yankee ingenuity kind of thing as opposed to retirees that wanted to escape harsh winters. And then they wanted the garden community with them and the automobile just dovetailed nicely into that vision of Los Angeles. So to try to retrofit that image on San Francisco was a disaster and I think that we're seeing that now. What I think is really fascinating about LA is how much of a head start we have on walking the best way to experience a city is to walk around it, to see it at that scale. I think that is what makes cities fine. That's what makes cities, you know, you enjoy a city because of that experience, that intimacy of seeing the buildings at that, at that speed. I have a lot of friends who are really trying to tackle that challenge of making downtown Los Angeles walkable. They're making all kinds of great headway. Salita Reynolds, for instance, a, a colleague of ours, now works as the Department of Transportation in LA, and we have such a fantastic legacy. It, it makes it that much easier for us to see why we, why we are such a desirable city. Uh, it makes us, um, when we talk about real estate, for the first time we see walk score. That's actually affecting property value. How walkable is your city? How fun is it to walk around? We see parents choosing schools that they get to live next to to walk to. That, to me, is the most impressive. It's not the transit, because that's a part of it. It's not necessarily the cars, because that's how you move around. But the bottom line is, it's a place you want to walk in, that's a great city. A place that you don't want to walk in is a city that will always have challenges. That was well, well said, Peter, thank you. 
It actually, it actually kind of, uh, and Michael, you kind of jumped into a thing I'd written down here this morning, and that was, I'd seen last week on Sunday, 60 Minutes, I'm still one of those people that watches that show, uh, they had a, a segment on driverless cars, and you mentioned, you know, we don't know what technology is coming, but uh, are we going to see driverless muni um, trains pretty soon? <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll take a stab at this. <laughs> Peter's saying, just say no. Um, I was actually at a conference last week on, um, that discussed a number of topics, including technology and transportation and driverless vehicles. And I think obviously there are boosters out there who want you to believe it, it's coming very soon. Um, and other people who say this is you know, science fiction, it's, not, it's many years away. I, th I think the truth is that it will come in, in some shape or form and it will probably be here sooner than many people believe. Um, and I think that this is one of those things that we don't really know exactly how it's going to play out. I've seen sort of the dystopian future where it's kind of like Wally, -E, who any of you have seen that, and everyone drives around in their little bubble and no one walks anywhere. And that's kind of the dystopian um, autonomous vehicle future. And, but I think the, um, the utopian future is really where um, people don't feel the need to, to own vehicles as much anymore. So we um, don't, maybe don't need as many parking spaces because people are sort of being dropped off and picked up with their, their vehicles that can um, get them on demand, and uh, we're able to reclaim um, space on sidewalks and streets, and that's where um, Peter's sort of vision of, of a more walkable, more place-making. Um, and I think that um, because of um, perhaps some of the um, on-demand nature of them and more cost-effectiveness, I think that it will end up um, extending our transit line and making it even more effective than it is today. And I think that um, we as policymakers really need to think about what this means for our city, for our state and country, um, what we want to do with this, and we need to get out ahead of it so we can be in that more utopian future and less in the dystopian Wall-E type future. Great, thanks, Mike. Grant? Uh, you've thought a lot about these issues. You've written books. Uh, if someone was to come from 1915, come to the ferry building, they look up and see the 1915 on the ferry building and think they were in the same place, and then they would turn around and see some other things. Um, in your mind, if a San Franciscan was to be transported from 1915 to 2015, as far as it concerns transit or transportation, what do you feel he or she would be most surprised about? I think just the density of people. I mean, they, San Francisco had maybe 400,000, 450,000 people in 1920, but I think they'd, they'd be struck by the well, noise level, the um, density of people, the number of vehicles. Uh, you, but you see they were getting into that right then with the trying to cross Market Street with the Jitneys. They were having their own, um, you know, uh, reality content, but, but I think that that's really what, what people would see here, just the, the size, the density um, would be really uh, very problematic for them. I, I had a thought that they might think it's all pretty cool until they tried taking transit to some places where it doesn't go anymore. I mean, San Francisco was so much more transit dependent. Imagine that they might shake their heads at us and say, you call that progress. I couldn't get there. It took me three or four transfers when back in 1915 I could do it on one ride. So. Sometimes we think that we always improve on things, and we take some back steps if, every once in a while. That's a, that's a good point, too. I know when I came to San Francisco, uh, and my credentials are my grandfather was born in San Francisco, but my mother her, uh, was born in Los Angeles, so I have a foot in both. But I'm a Dodgers fan, I have to admit. Even though I've lived here for many, many years, you can't change your baseball allegiance. Um, that said, um, if you were to uh, think about uh, issues now as it relates to transportation, um, we, we understand from Grant's talk that there were controversies 100 years ago, that the public was very much involved. The, the press seemed to have a much larger role than it does today. I know that Michael and, and uh, Peter faced public involvement issues and so on, and, and trying to you know, uh, be responsive to the public. Two things that occurred to me in reading uh, transportation history and so on, and I was with Caltrans, and I was, uh, when I came to San Francisco, I saw the freeway right in front of the ferry building, and I was unhappy about that as anybody else, and thought, that's not right. That's a le legacy from the 40s and 50s. And some things do improve over time, and some things maybe you take a step back. But the, the issue I was going to ask you, with respect to transportation, we see a large involvement of the federal government now, Whereas in 1915, they were silent in these kind of things. 
We see, uh, in the case of Southern California, private industry. Uh, the Pacific Electric, for example, uh, was uh, private real estate driven with Henry E. Huntington. And here in San Francisco, as you said, Grant, it was maybe the first in the nation to have a municipal owned railroad. The public owned it. That was very unique and, and uh, rare at that point in time. But what, what do you see, looking back now from what we know now, how is, it, how is it different? So we have rail lines, and we talked about some of the new technology and so on. How else has it differed? The federal transportation picture is different. We have long environmental processes, right? I know uh, the environmental document process time for the Venice bus rapid transit took longer than it did to conceptualize the PPIE and build the infrastructure. <laughs> Um, and that's not even uh, rail so much. That's, uh, you know, buses, tires, and technology on the ground. So in your mind, you're, with you through gentlemen, how would you like to think about that, where we are today and where we were 100 years ago? Well, I think you can't get very far in that conversation without thinking about the challenge of money. And Mike, Michael knows that more than anybody because he helps the city with a lot of the funding. I, I, you know, the costs of operating transit are really what make it a challenge today. It's not so much the capital, that's a function of labor, that's a function of so many good things. We can't look at, you know, livable wages and the improvements of labor and not understand how that means if you want a driver of a train, you've got to make sure that driver's got insurance, you've got to make sure that driver's got, you know, a salary that can, can raise a family. A, a nickel a, a ride wouldn't cut it anymore. And so when you look at it that way, you have to be a lot more efficient with what's left over. What I think is interesting is, in my estimation, Eisenhower and the idea of the national defense mechanism of building freeways across the country was the first really big nationwide federal government investment in transportation that, that was public. And what we're waiting for is that kind of response for transit. And we talk a bit about it with some of the, the you know, what we tried to do with Amtrak or what we're looking with high-speed rail. But for Michael and me, I think we can say you, you can't make major transit improvements without a strong partnership in the federal government. And what I like to see, and it's much more volatile than you know. I've been through a lot of administrations. I mean, Carter, um, who came after Carter? What am I doing? Uh, Ford, <laughs> Reagan, Clinton, Bush, um, no, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, right? Um, and what a difference depending on the administration, on the way they think about cities, the way they think about investing in infrastructure, the way, I mean, it's, it was, there's some really stunningly different perspectives on what, how valuable cities are to the country, and then how valuable the networks are that makes the cities livable. I think that that's, you'll see that. It's, it's always gonna be part of every campaign when we talk about investing in infrastructure and how it goes. I, I don't want to play partisan hands. I, I'm in San Francisco. I can probably take a guess that a lot of people might feel a certain way, but I would say this. You, you really do need to think about, it's not just a one-time investment and then you cross your fingers and hopes it wor hope it works. It's a continual investment. It's a lot of investment in infrastructure, the life of infrastructure. We talked about the earthquakes. We won't be resilient unless we think about that kind of investment that keeps our city vital and keeps these connections to people always going on, especially in a time of emergency. So I think the days of relying on the federal government are here with us, but the partnership with the government could be a lot smarter than we've seen in some of the cycles in the past. Yeah, um, I agree with a lot of what Peter said. You know, I've been in the more recent um, current administration, and I think he's leaving out the other, um, one of the other houses of government, which is of course the legislature. And um, it's been a really, really challenging um, past four to six years. Um, the federal government has not passed a new transportation bill. And we, um, which what that means is it's sort of how do we rely on funding to know what, what we can build? Um, it's modernizing that transportation bill to make it fit in today's context. And it's something that we in the, in the locals have really uh, been waiting for and pressing for. And it's easy for us to say that in San Francisco, where, as Peter said, our, our um, politics tend to lean one way. Uh, but the gridlock in Congress is really a, a major challenge because that federal partnership is so crucial. And I think um, because of that, what you're seeing is a lot of locals learning to help themselves. So we have a half cent sales tax for transportation here. 
uh, that goes straight back into, into San Francisco for transportation improvements. Um, those of you who voted last fall may have voted to pass a um, government bond um, as well as um, a dedicated transportation set aside within the, the city budget. And I think that this is a trend that we're seeing in cities like San Francisco that are saying we, we need to build um, and we need to do it now um, in order to not only build new infrastructure, but actually be able to maintain the existing infrastructure that we have. And this is a, this is a real problem federally, and I think something that um, you're gonna see um, more local governments trying to take at least more of the, the power into their own hands through, through local dollars. Um, that's all I'll say. And you know, I uh, had the opportunity in my retirement to, to get into this area and, and pursue it as an avocation, unlike my colleagues here. And I, when I put together the book on Muni's history, looking back on 100 years, it's a very interesting perspective. You're not tied to the, the uh, current situation and struggles. And I came up at the end of it with like an algorithm. Uh, what is it that happens to make Muni successful? You have to start with a vision. And you have to have behind that vision political will. You also have to have competent engineering and construction management to make sure that the costs are done, uh, it's done within cost and on time. You also have to have uh, ongoing competent operational supervision on the streets. And you also have to dedicate uh, ongoing money to maintenance. You can't run out of transmissions and expect the system to be running. And all of that adds together with you have to have public buy-in and public support. And looking back over the 100 years of Muni, and we can look at it from the point of view of the PPIE and its contributions here too. The same thing applies. And what happens is if anything happens in any of those areas as a glitch, you've got a Muni meltdown, you've got an atrocity story, you've got all sorts of public indignation. But when it all works miraculously, no one notices. And you've got a smoothly operating transit system hauling 800,000 people a day and a regional transit system that's even larger. So I think that what we need to recognize is that the system works you know, um, better and worse some days than others, but all in all, it's a really remarkable combination of factors that have to work. And we do re rely on the vision. It starts with that, and it starts with people like our governor who envisions a, um, um, uh, a ra uh, rail service to Los Angeles connect connectivity, but again, you have to have all these factors lined up. But it also requires planners who are able to stand on the shoulders of the people that we're celebrating tonight and the visionaries of 100 years ago and to go out and do the real hard work today. It's very different for them to do their job today than it was back 100 years ago. And so we're really entrusting uh, our future and your children's future and grandchildren's future in their hands. And we look forward to the, the products and we wish you many miracles. <laughs> Thank you, Grant. And uh, I think that's a good way to maybe segue into the audience uh, questions and uh, maybe comments you have about anything tonight. Yes, please, you first. Does the city and county of San Francisco have a climate adaptation plan, actual plan that we could read? And if so, how does that affect what you do? So the SF Environment is the department that's preparing that plan and maintaining it. I can, I can certainly, I, I, I mean, I guess we don't have internet access to get you to the link, but that they, they do maintain, they're required to maintain uh, a climate ad adaptation plan. There's a part of it that's transportation. They need us to build out that part of it. We work together on, on that. And yes, uh, the short answer is yes, that they do that. And we, I could certainly help you maybe after, like with the contact information to get a look at it, or just search. Uh, oh, yeah, what I'm worried about is, how does it deal with rising sea levels and, and drought and, and right. those issues that would affect growth? And how does that impact whether or not you, you build this much or infrastructure or this much? That, that's a great question. Some of the waterfront projects, that we talked about the funding for that, uh, the transportation. We're not going to be smart unless we get the private sector to pay their fair share. Like you look at the Giants ballpark and they built a lot of stuff that otherwise would have come off the public expense. But what we need everyone on the waterfront to do is hold to a standard, a standard of height anticipating a 50 and 100 year level sea rise. And that's talked about as, as much as 55 inches or something. Like I'm looking at my friend Lawrence to see if that sounds about right. I just came from a talk where we talked about resilience. And to the extent that we can get people who are building 
to always be building to that vision, that's going to draw down the bill we'll have to pay. Because eventually, if the sea level is rising and we don't plug those gaps, it doesn't matter if 80% of the waterfront is braced for it, and the 20% is where the water is going to come through. So that is one way we're doing it. Every private development happening has to adhere to it. It's a, it's a bigger expense, but it's the only way you can invest in the future. The final bill about how the whole city is going to do this waterfront resilience is, I, I think, a challenge that we're just grappling with right now. Okay, and how about drought and how that affects whether or not the city can continue to grow? Drought. So that's a bit of a different than a transportation question, but I, <laughs> as I'm drinking the water here, uh, I, I mean, that's a really good question. I would say this, that we do believe there is a link between the, the carbon emissions and the activity of the, the, the bad legacy of really leaning heavily on fossil fuels and how that's affected the climate to some of the sort of episodic things we're seeing with climate right now. I, it's hard to fix drought, but it's easy to change the travel behavior that contributes to the pollution that's driving the global warming, that's creating the climate change patterns. So we can do things at a local level, and that's a small part of the whole global challenge. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Yes, back in the, back in the room. Sure. So the question was the Warriors Arena and particularly the, the agreement between UCSF, the hospital, and the Warriors about transportation. Um, I worked a bit with a lot of the folks who are doing that, and I can tell you here's what I know. Um, the Warriors is another example, like the Giants, of a project that knows that they can't get this arena unless they're contributing to transportation. So some of the press release information I saw, four new streetcars that come along as part of the deal so that they're not taking streetcars out of other neighborhoods to handle the crush load. They're going to own that with these purchases. But the or hospital thing was a trickier challenge because unlike a lot of the patterns of people working downtown and going home the other direction from when people might be going to a night game, there is a nurse shift at UC Hospital that starts at 7 o'clock, which is about the same time that a lot of people are coming into the Warriors Arena. So the work has been on the local hospital access plan, and the strategy has been to look at streets in Mission Bay that don't contribute to getting to an arena parking facility, but it gets you right to the hospital. Identifying those, there's about six street corridors that can be maintained for emergency access to the hospital, for people who live in Mission Bay to get to, let's say, Mariposa, but separate that out from the people going to the arena. The separation process requires parking control officers. They're always smarter than traffic signals. They know how to unblock streets so the streets can go through, but they cost money. So that was one of the challenges with the Warriors to say, if you're going to make this work and nurses still need to be able to get to work on time, can you partner with the city to make sure that there's at least 17 to 21 parking control officers, especially, this is what I understand, with a dual event. The Giants and the Warriors might be having an event in the same night. So that's part of that plan that we read about. It's the agreement that the Warriors are going to foot the bill for not just the extra transit, but the traffic management. UC worked with them to map out a network. And, the and I worked extensively with the residents of Mission Bay so that it's not just a hospital plan, it's a local resident access plan. That's more or less what they've been summarizing in the paper today. And are we going to get hit with higher rates for our, our fast passes? The, the, the comment is that the fast passes are more expensive. Yes. I mean, are we going to keep seeing them go up, up, up every single January? You know? I, I, I understand that they're trying to index the, the transit costs with the cost of living. So, I, yeah, I mean, that's, like, again, a bit of a, a one-off for me to try and explain other than uh, what I just said. Sorry. Thank you, Peter. Yes, yes please. Um, so one of the things that I found interesting was how you saying the, the Muni system was uh, financed by the city bond issue and I was wondering if you could go into some of the value capture techniques used then and, and how that worked. You were saying that there were certain uh, I guess assessment techniques and compare that with now and our ability to use uh, value capture to finance uh, capital transit projects. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things when you look back historically at Muni. Um, the use of uh, beneficial, what we I guess call now beneficial use districts. The Stockton Street Tunnel was paid for by the um, uh, people that own property along that corridor. Um, the Twin Peaks Tunnel was uh, paid for by people who lived in the western part of San Francisco and a small group that lived near the east portal of that. So that model of um, uh, people, are, and, and also the, the J-Line right away through Mission Park was paid for by people who lived along there. So when we look back historically, 100 years ago, we were using very creative uh, forms of um, not just bond issues, which the Muni, because it was a public entity, could use bonds, whereas a private um, transit provider couldn't. But they were also going into this other approach. And I think it's something we have to uh, look back to and remember that we are asking, like we're talking about the Warriors, if you want to build it and you're going to get a benefit out of it, there's ongoing costs that are um, sometimes hidden and, and borne by the, the citizens that you have to pay for. So I think that's kind of what you're trying to address. And it, just another interesting fact, Embarcadero Station is a good example. I don't know if people know that was not part of the original BART station plan. That station was built through the money that the extra value of those downtown buildings would have added to, to the uh, what they call tax increment. So the BART system stopped at Montgomery, didn't have a station in Embarcadero. That station was built basically by private money. And if you go to the Transbay Terminal site, you're seeing a really vivid example of a promise that these projects that are under construction there are supposed to pay for help pay for significant transit infrastructure. The bus connections, the high-speed rail connections, the Caltrain connections are all part of this formula that's kind of a modern version of the value capture idea. Yeah, just as a, another um, plug for a project that I'm working on right now, there's a, um, many people who work in the planning department know there's sort of area plan fees that go, and it's basically if we allow you to upzone and build higher and more densely, then we expect to capture some of the value back to the city to be able to build some of the transportation infrastructure. And there's a lot of these areas around the city. Um, right now, sort of being contemplated by the Board of Supervisors is a new uh, transportation sustainability fee. And the idea there is that new development who comes to the city, um, they will help pay to offset some of their impact on the transit system. So things like uh, more crowded vehicles, um, you know, hopefully trying to keep some of things like fares down or just to build new infrastructure to help keep uh, Muni and, and other regional operators running and um, it's a way to say this is great we want this growth but at the same time you need to offset some of the impact that you have to our system and that's a sort of again maybe not a novel way of thinking but a good way to understand we don't want to lose some of the value that we're just providing. Thank you. Yes sir. Along with the, uh, the TSP, the Transportation Sustainability Plan, uh, the Nexus study at a higher fee rate. And so really, there's a 75% discount that is being proposed by the Board of Supervisors, or it's gonna go through the sausage factory there. And never once did they go and contact the people that are gonna be stuck having to pay that 75% discount, which is really uh, groups uh, in the neighborhoods and the property owners that are gonna be not in the area of development because we're going to be seeing greater bond issues and everything. So I agree that you know the entities that are causing the growth should be paying for that growth. And I'd like to and address this 75% discount that everybody wants to get for the developers. But I mean they're the driving force behind it. I think so. Maybe you can embellish on that 75% discount. Sure, yeah, I think um, to paraphrase the question, so um, as part of the study of the new transportation sustainability fee, you look at what the full impact is of new development, and um, the fee as it's being proposed is only um, charging a portion of that fee. Um, what's paired with what's called the nexus study that um, sets that fee is what's known as a feasibility study, and this looks at essentially how much of the fee um, can you charge before you start to impact um, essentially whether people can develop or not. And so the accompanying study, the feasibility study, said that we could only charge a portion, otherwise there would, um, we would be unable to um, allow new development to happen. And that was sort of a, an early on goal of the project was to capture as much fee as possible while not affecting people's ability to develop. And there, there is some um, 
there's some number <laughs> that uh, if you could look into your crystal ball, you would say this is the exact number to get the exact max value. Um, but at the same time, um, if people are unable to develop, then you don't get any of the fee. And we know that we have significant transportation needs that um, are coming just based on the development that is happening right now today for people who are paying nothing. So um, the goal is to get a fee that is workable and captures as much value as possible for the city. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. We were supposed to end the program at 7.30, and I think that's what my hourglass says. Um, the gentleman here probably will be able to speak to you one-on-one -on -one for a little while after this presentation, but we have to basically wrap it up. So if you would join me in thanking our uh, very excellent panel tonight for very stimulating and interesting conversation.